Well, hi everyone. Thank you all for coming. Today, I'm going to be talking about how you can run Microsoft SQL Server in Compute Engine in a highly available manner. And by the end of the session, I want you to know what that looks like, the issues you might run into, and where you can go to get more information on setting this up. I won't be talking about the Cloud SQL announcement from yesterday, but I do feel a bit bit blindsided by it, to be honest. So first, I want to talk about myself for a little bit. My name is Tom. I'm a reliability engineer at Rackspace. I've been at Rackspace for about five and a half years, and I've been working with Google Cloud for the past 18 months. My background is as a Windows sysad, which I did for over 10 years, and which is why, about 18 months ago, I was asked to join our managed Google team as the first Windows expert globally. Now, my first task in that role was to figure out just how we could support Windows in GCP. And my second task was to figure out how we can do highly available SQL. So a lot of what you're going to see here is based on my first few months in that role, as well as some learnings that we've taken from customers along the way. So you may have noticed a picture have rather a few flags in there, and that's because that Rackspace likes rewarding rackers with flags. Each of those represents a different certification that I managed to achieve. And I actually have all of the GCP certs, including the network and security ones. I have a couple of Microsoft certs as well. So I think that makes me pretty well placed to talk about this subject. Finally, you may have noticed my accent. I'm not from around here. I'm from a little island called Britain that you may have heard of. There are a few things going on there at the moment, but thankfully I get to distract myself by watching the rugby. Although, please avoid any talk about the Six Nations because that's still a bit of a sore point. If you don't know what rugby is, it's a bit like American football, except there's a lot less padding and we throw the ball backwards rather than forwards. Now, you, you didn't come here to listen to me talk about myself all day. So this is what I'm going to be covering for the rest of the session. I'm going to start off by looking at the various options that are available in SQL Server. And that won't just be from a high availability perspective. I'm also going to cover things like disaster recovery and read scaling. This will be quite general. It won't be GCP specific. The GCP specific stuff is going to be in section two where I'll show you what a highly available SQL architecture in GCP actually looks like. I'll also talk through a few of the caveats, a few of the things that you need to watch out for, and then I'll move on to doing a quick demo just so you can see what it looks like in real life. So let's start by looking at what options are available in SQL Server. And you can see this rather nice Venn diagram. I have three main areas on there. There's high availability, if you want to be protecting against individual instance failures. There's disaster recovery, if you want to be protecting against entire region failures. And there's also read scaling, if either your application has quite high read requirements, or you have a geographically redundant app, geographically spread app, that would benefit from more data locality. So for high availability, one of the options you might consider is failover clustering. It's a much older technology, much more widely known, and especially if you already have existing SAN infrastructure, it might be a good option for you, at least on-prem. For disaster recovery, you might have thought about using SQL mirroring, although Microsoft are deprecating that in favor of the basic availability group, which I'll be talking about a bit later on. Log shipping is probably a better option if you're just doing disaster recovery. It is a lot more simple to set up, has very few requirements. It's essentially just a few SQL jobs that run on nodes to back up databases on one instance and restore them on another. So it's very easy. You can also do read scaling if you really want to, but I probably wouldn't use log shipping for that. If you're trying to do transactional read scaling, log shipping isn't really a good fit because your clients are going to be constantly disconnected when those restore operations are happening. And there's also going to be quite a bit of latency between the backup and the restore. So for transactional rescaling, you're probably better off with something like replication. 
It's a bit more complex to set up than log shipping, but it's pretty good at doing read scaling. And then in the middle, you have always on. Always on can actually do all three of these things. It can do high availability, it can do disaster recovery, and it can do read scaling. So if you want one technology that can do all three of these things, always on is a really good option. Before moving on, I will point out that you can actually mix and match these as well. So you could have a failover cluster that uses log shipping for disaster recovery if you wanted to. For the rest of the session though, I'm just going to focus on failover clustering and always on. That's because they're the high availability options. So let's start by taking a look at failover clustering. As I said, it's a much older technology, quite well understood, and it's a pretty simple concept. You have an IP address up there that can float between all of the instances in your cluster, and that's what your client will use to access the instance. You have multiple servers as members of your cluster, and then to those servers, you present some kind of shared storage. That shared storage is typically a SAN LUN, so you need some existing SAN infrastructure there. It can also be an SMB3 file share if you're using Windows Server 2016 or above. But if you are using a file share, you need to make sure that's highly available as well. And then you put your databases, both your databases and the system databases, on that shared storage. This is what it looks like in normal operation. You have the IP address on the active instance. You have the SQL services running on only the active instance. They're stopped on all of the passive instances. You have that shared storage mounted on the primary instance. And you have that primary instance servicing the traffic. When you initiate a failover, the SQL services are first stopped on the primary instance. That process can actually take a few seconds to complete because SQL will, will wait for any pending transactions to complete. But once the services have stopped, the shared storage will be dismounted from the primary active instance. The IP address will be removed from that instance's NIC. The storage will be mounted onto your passive server. And then the IP address will be added to your passive server's NIC. Finally, the services will be started up on the passive server. Now, the amount of time it takes for SQL services to start up can be quite variable, but it can also be quite a long period of time. When the SQL services start up, they have to read some database and table metadata into memory, and some transactions may need to be replayed. So you may find that this whole process could take anything from 30 seconds to complete if you have relatively small databases, up to a few minutes if your database is a terabyte in size. And that's 30 seconds to a few minutes that your clients aren't able to access any of these databases. So the failover itself can be quite slow. So if we go over a few of the considerations for a failover cluster, you only require a single copy of the databases because they exist on that shared storage. There is a requirement for shared storage. As I said, that will typically be a SAN LUN or an SMB3 file share. The failover can be relatively slow just because of the process it has to go through. You can't span data centers natively with this. And what I mean by that is there's nothing in the SQL failover cluster that will allow you to span data centers. You can actually achieve this if your SAN array supports block level replication or if you're using Windows Server 2016, where you have options for using block level replication within that. But with what you get with a failover cluster, this isn't something you can actually do. And those passive servers are really just sat there doing nothing. I kind of need to caveat that slightly. So the passive servers aren't able to service traffic for an individual failover cluster instance that is only active on a single node at a time. But you can actually add multiple failover cluster instances to the same Windows cluster. Although bear in mind, if you do that, then you need some kind of logic in your application to know which instance to connect to for the database you're trying to access. So now let's move on to always on, specifically availability groups. This was introduced in SQL Server 2012. 
the standard availability groups are currently only available in the enterprise edition of SQL. Although in the standard edition of SQL, you can use the basic availability group. The basic availability group is a lot like a standard availability group. It just has a few key limitations, such as only being able to have a maximum of two servers as a member of that availability group, and only being able to have a single database within there as well. You also can't use read scaling with the basic availability group. Before going into always on in a bit more detail, first just want to cover off a couple of terms, just so we all know what they are. An availability group is the simplest unit of failover within an always on cluster. You add your databases to the availability group and you fail over an entire availability group, which means that all the databases within there will be failed over at the same time. You can only add a database to a single availability group at a time, but a single SQL instance can host multiple availability groups at the same time. An availability group may also have zero or more listeners. The listener is the access point that the client will use. It has a DNS name, which is what the client should use to connect, and it also has one or more dedicated IPs. A listener can only be associated with a single availability group at a time, and through Management Studio, you can only assign a single listener to an availability group. As I said, a, an availability group can have multiple listeners, but to do that, you have to go into Failover Cluster Manager, add the listeners there, and then run some T-SQL whenever you perform a failover. If you go to the link on the screen or scan the QR code, it will take you to some documentation that shows you how to set those up. You may be wondering why you want multiple listeners, and I'll talk about that a bit later on. This is what Always On looks like. You still have this single listener that can float between all of the servers in the cluster. You still have multiple servers in the cluster. But the key difference here is that you don't have any shared storage. Each of these servers has its own set of local storage. On that local storage, you'll add your databases, or you add your databases to the, to the availability group, and then those databases will be replicated to the storage on all of the instances within the cluster. However, what isn't replicated are any of the system databases. So when you install a SQL instance in an always-on cluster, what you actually just install is a normal SQL instance, the same way you would if you weren't using always on. That does mean that you can use GC images to build these, by the way, and then add them to a cluster afterwards. So because the system databases aren't replicated, that means anything that you add to a system database needs to be added to all of these instances individually. So SQL logins, SQL jobs, they don't get replicated, you somehow have to manage adding them to all of these instances. This is what always on looks like in service. The listener is on the active instance. The services this time are running on all of the servers in the cluster at the same time. They're not stopped on any of the passive ones. And you have the primary database in read-write mode. You also have the secondary database in read-only mode. And then you have the primary database replicating over to the secondary database. When you initiate a failover, the primary database is marked as read-only. The direction of replication is flipped. The secondary database is marked as read-write. And the listener is moved to the secondary instance. And that's it. That's the failover complete. Now, you may think that looks quite quick. Actually, this is a really quick process probably take you a few seconds most of the time. What's even better is that is an actually predictable amount of time. There's a configuration parameter you can set in your availability group to say how long this failover should take to complete. Now, I did mention you can also use an always-on availability group for read scaling, and this is how you would do it. So for a normal client request to an availability group, the client will connect to the listener, the listener will connect the client to the active instance, and then the active instance will service the request. If you want to use read-only, if you want to use read scaling, you need to take advantage of read-only routing. To do that, you specify this in your connection string, 
application intent equals read only, the client will still connect to the listener. The listener will still connect the client to the primary instance. However, the difference here is that the primary instance will see that this has been specified in the connection string. And rather than servicing the request itself, it will consult its read-only routing list to, de to determine which instance should service the request. Now, the read-only routing list effectively says that if this particular instance is active, then these instances are able to service read requests for it. So you could have a read-only routing list that says whenever SQL 1 is active, then both SQL 2 and SQL 3 are able to service the request. And you, you could have a second entry in there that says that if SQL 2 is active, then only SQL 1 is able to service that request. So once the active instance has consulted its read-only routing list, it will pick an instance for the client to connect to. It will tell the client to connect to that instance, and then the client or the secondary instance will service the request. So these are the considerations that you have for always on generally. Each node has to have a copy of the databases on it, so your storage requirements might be increased by using this. However, there's no requirement for shared storage, so you can actually get away with using cheaper storage. The failover is relatively fast and can actually be predictable, and you can natively span data centers with this. The underlying technology here is essentially SQL mirroring, and because of that, your SQL instances can actually be anywhere. They could be on-prem, could be in another cloud provider, could be in another GCP region. It doesn't really matter. You can put them anywhere. And finally, those secondary instances can get some use. They can be used as read replicas. So what, what would I recommend you actually use in GCP? And this has kind of changed slightly given the announcement yesterday. So I'd say if what you're looking for is highly available SQL and you have very standard requirements, then actually the managed cloud SQL offering might be a pretty compelling offer. Because it's a PaaS option, you won't have so much management overhead. The only problem is you won't get as much flexibility. So if you wanted to do high availability and still maintain the flexibility of managing your own SQL instances, you really have the choice between failover clustering and always on. The problem with failover clustering is this requirement for shared storage. In GCP, a persistent disk can only be mounted to a single instance at a time in read-write mode. That means that you can't really use shared storage in GCP for a failover cluster. You could create, you could use the block-level replication options within Windows Server 2016 to get around that, but then you're adding additional management overhead and additional complexity to this and really, you might as well just use always on from the start because it's designed for this type of scenario. The one thing you may be considering there is the licensing cost because, as I said, for a standard availability group, you have to use the Enterprise Edition of SQL. That means you're paying a much larger licensing cost. However, you may be able to get away with using the basic availability group. You may find that the limitations don't really affect you that much. So now let's take a look at what always on actually looks like within GCP. So what I'm going to build up here is a diagram that shows you a single region deployment of always on. After building that diagram up, I'll explain what slight differences there would be with a multi-region deployment. So you'll start by picking a region. That region should have at least three zones, and then you'll pick three of those zones to use. I've called them zone A, zone B, and zone C. You'll then create three subnets. One of those subnets will be your shared services subnet. That will have instances deployed into it in all three of these zones. You'll then have a second subnet, which I've called the SQL1 subnet. That will have a single instance deployed into it, and that instance will be in zone A. And then you'll create the, your third subnet, that again will have a single instance deployed into it, and that instance will be in zone C. You'll then create two domain controllers, both in subnet one, with one of them in zone A and one of them in zone C. The reason we create them in zo those zones is to avoid 
is to minimize the intrazone traffic between the SQL instances and the domain controllers. Although again, given Google announced managed AD yesterday, that might be a good option to use as well. You'll also create a file share witness in zone B. The file share witness is effectively just a file server and all it's doing is providing quorum for the cluster to avoid any sort of split brain scenarios. The reason we're deploying it into zone B is because a Microsoft best practice is to keep your file share witness in a zone that doesn't have any SQL services in it. That's to avoid any sort of network partitioning effects. Once you've done that, you'll create two SQL instances. One of those SQL instances will be in subnet two. The other one will be in subnet three. Those SQL instances will have their own set of persistent disks. They will also have an alias IP range specified on them. Now, if you don't know what an alias IP range is, it's effectively a subnet of the subnet that the instance is deployed in. And it tells GCP that any requests for IPs within that alias IP range should be sent to that instance. So it just means you can add additional IP addresses to that instance and GCP will know how to route the requests. You'll then create a Windows cluster. That Windows cluster will have the two SQL instances as members. It will also have the file share witness as its quorum. And it will have some core cluster resources in there as well. Those cluster resources will have a DNS name and they will also have two IP addresses in this case. That's because it, those core cluster resources will have an IP address from each of the alias IP ranges that are specified on the SQL instance. What this means is that that resource can be hosted on either of these instances. Failover Cluster Manager will check to see if there is an IP that is in the same subnet as the primary IP of the instance you're failing over to. And if there is, it will bring that resource online. You'll then create some availability groups. In this case, I've created two. Those availability groups will have some databases within them. Those availability groups can also be filled over independently. And the availability groups will have their own listeners. Again, the listeners will have a DNS name and they will have two IPs, one from each of the alias IP ranges on the SQL instances. So that's the single region deployment of Always On. With the multi-region deployment, it looks quite similar. There are only a couple of changes that you'd actually make. The first is you would deploy some domain controllers into that region as well and create a shared services subnet within that region. That you create at least two domain controllers for redundancy. You'll also create additional SQL instances in that region. And with those SQL instances, you will create them each in their own subnet and you will specify an alias IP range on them. You'll then add additional IPs to all of the cluster resources that are from those alias IP ranges you specified. Effectively, your cluster resources should have the same number of IP addresses as you have SQL instances within that cluster. Finally, the file share witness should actually be moved to its own region because if you have a multi-region deployment, the best practice there is to ensure it's deployed into a region that doesn't have any SQL services within it. Again, that's to avoid any sort of network partitioning effects. So one of the things you're going to have to choose when you create the availability group is the availability mode. You've got two choices here, synchronous and asynchronous. With the synchronous availability mode, transactions are only committed on the primary database once the secondary databases have confirmed that the transactions have been committed on them. This is really good from a data consistency perspective because it means you can guarantee that the secondaries are up to date with the primary. However, from a write performance perspective, it's not quite so good. Because your primary is having to wait for your secondaries to commit transactions, you'll actually find that your write performance is decreased. So you should only really use this when the latency between the instances is relatively low and data consistency is your primary concern. Asynchronous availability mode, on the other hand, commits the transactions immediately on the primary database 
And then the primary database doesn't really care what happens with the secondaries. It's really good from a write performance perspective because there is no impact on your write performance. However, it's not quite so good from a data consistency perspective because if you try to fail over to one of these instances, there's a chance you might lose data. Now, the good news is this isn't a choice that you have to make at the availability group level. You can configure this on each of the instances within the availability group. So the way that I would typically see this being used is that you would have your primary region and the instances that you deploy into your primary region will use the synchronous availability mode. The reason for this is that the latency between those instances is going to be relatively low, tens of milliseconds maybe, and you're most likely to be failing over between instances that are within the same region. If you deploy SQL instances to any other regions, you'll use the asynchronous availability mode. The reason for that is that you're unlikely to be failing over to that region unless there's a disaster. And if there's a disaster, you can probably afford some data loss. And the latency between the instances in different regions is relatively high. You're looking at hundreds of milliseconds as opposed to tens. So if you were to try and use synchronous avail availability across regions, you'll probably find that your write performance is affected a bit too much. So client connectivity is the next thing you might be thinking about, especially because these listeners might have multiple IPs. So how exactly do clients connect to those instances? Well, as I said, the clients should connect using the DNS name. And in the default configuration, the failover cluster manager will register every possible IP address within DNS. If you have an always on aware client, you should use this in your connection string multi-subnet failover equals true. That will tell the client to attempt to connect to all of those IP addresses at the same time. And as soon as one of the connections is successful, it will stop trying to connect to the rest of them. This allows failover to be as fast as possible. Legacy clients, unfortunately, are going to get back a list of IP addresses. They're going to pick one at random to connect to. And if that happens to be an IP address that isn't currently online, your client's going to get a timeout. So if you do have a legacy client, you should configure these two parameters on the listener cluster resource. The first is register all providers IP, which you should set to zero. That tells the client that it should only register the currently active IP address in DNS. You should also lower the host record TTL. By default, that's set to 20 minutes. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be waiting 20 minutes for my client to fail over. You should probably reduce that to something a lot more sensible. Maybe start at two minutes and see if that's all right for you. If not, lower it a bit more. Although do bear in mind that the lower the host record TTL, the more DNS traffic is going to hit your domain controllers. If you do want to be able to configure these listener parameters, you can go to the link on the screen and it will take you to a GitHub gist that will give you a PowerShell snippet that shows you how to do that. What about Linux? When we were at a Google conference, we should talk about Linux at some point. So the good news is that you can actually run SQL Server on Linux, and you've been able to since SQL Server 2016. If you really wanted to, you could run it in a Docker container as well. Also, since SQL Server 2016, and in fact Windows Server 2016, the main independent availability groups have been a possibility. So in Windows Server 2016, Microsoft introduced the domain independent cluster. Previously, all the members of a cluster had to be part of the same domain. But in Windows Server 2016, that limitation was removed. And members of a cluster could be from different domains, different forests, or even just work group joined. The domain independent availability group was introduced in SQL Server 2016 just as a way of creating availability groups on top of those domain independent clusters. Now, this was brought along to SQL Server on Linux in SQL Server 2017, and you're actually able to create availability groups on top of pacemaker clusters. You may also be wondering if you can mix Windows and Linux servers within the same availability group. And the answer is that you sort of can. The issue with it is that you don't get any sort of high availability. 
And that's just because there's no common cluster manager to mediate the failover of the IP address. If you go to the link on the screen, there's a lot more detail about how you would set this up on Linux. Now, you may be wondering about backups. It's quite an important topic, and it's not really one that I'm going to go into a huge amount of detail today, mainly because it's probably a session in its own right. I will give you a couple of options that you could look at, though. The first is creating some SQL jobs on each of the instances within your cluster, putting some logic in that job to ensure it only runs on a single instance at a time, potentially just by seeing if that instance is the currently active one for the availability group, and then having a step within the SQL job to offload that backup onto cloud storage. There are also a number of third-party products that you can use that will be able to back up these databases to cloud storage. So I've gone about half an hour, and I'm a reliability engineer, and this is the first time I've talked about monitoring. Again, I'm not going to go into lots of detail about monitoring, mainly because this is probably an entire conference in its own right. However, I will say that the StatDriver monitoring agent can be installed on Windows, and when it is installed on Windows, it's able to gather SQL Server metrics. The StatDriver logging agent can also be installed on Windows, and by default, that will collect only the Windows event logs. SQL Server does log some things to the event log, so you may be able to just get away with logging those, but you can also configure StatDriver logging to ingest text-based logs, which SQL Server also keeps. So StatDriver logging would be a good option for any sort of log management. Finally, if endpoint health is something you want to monitor, StatDriver monitoring does actually give you the option of using uptime checks. So you could see if that would suit your purpose. So finally, for this section, let's just go over some considerations for always on in GCP. Each SQL Server Compute Engine instance requires its own subnet. The file share witness should be in a zone in a single region deployment or a region in a multi-region deployment that has no SQL instances in it. Active Directory isn't actually a requirement anymore, but I still highly recommend that you include it. It's mainly because it makes management a lot easier and if you've ever tried setting up certificate authentication for SQL Server, you'll probably wish you had Active Directory to use instead. Synchronous replication should be used for instances that are in the same region. And conversely, asynchronous replication should be used for instances that are in different regions. So now let's move on to a quick demo, just so you can see what this looks like. Quick demo. There we go. So this is a GCP console. You can see that there are a number of instances here. I have two domain controllers, a file share witness, and two SQL instances. All of these instances are in the same network. And you can see that the two domain controllers and the file share witness are all in the same subnet. The two SQL instances are in different subnets, as you can see here. If I take a look at SQL 1, you can see that it has an alias IP range configured, and that alias IP range falls within the range of the subnet that this instance is in. If I switch over to SQL 1 and reconnect to SQL 1, this is what failover cluster manager would look like. You can see that the core cluster resources are currently running on SQL 1. And if I scroll down, you can see that there is a resource for the file share witness, as well as a resource for the DNS name for the core cluster resources. And if I expand that, you can see that the IP address that's online is the one from the same subnet as SQL 1. If I switch to the roles that are running within this cluster, I have two availability groups. AG1 is currently running on SQL 1, and AG2 is currently running on SQL 2. If I look at the resources within AG1, you can see that there's a resource for the availability group. There's also a resource for the listener. And if I expand the listener, you can see that the IP address that's online is in the same subnet as SQL 1. 
If I look at the same thing for AG2, you'll see the same resources. The only difference here is that the IP address that's online is in SQL2 subnet. So if I switch over to Management Studio, you can see that SQL1 has four databases on it. All four databases are in the synchronized state. And SQL2 has the same four databases, again, all in the synchronized state. If I take a look at the availability groups on SQL 1, you'll see that SQL 1 is primary for AG 1 and secondary for AG 2. If I take a look at SQL 2, you'll see it's the other way around. So let's take a look at the properties of one of these availability groups. You can see that AG 1 has two databases in it, DB 1 and DB 2. It also has two instances as a member of the availability group. Those instances are both using the synchronous commit availability mode. And I can actually easily change this to asynchronous if I want to, just by selecting it here. They're also set to use the automatic failover mode. That just means that if one of these instances fails, the other can automatically pick up from it. I can change that to manual if I would like to. And in fact, if I'm using the asynchronous commit mode, then manual is my only option. You can also see that the instances are set to be readable secondaries. If I take a look at the read-only routing list, you can see that there are two instances. They each have their own read-only routing URL, which tells the client where to connect to. And then they have their own individual read-only routing list. So now let's try doing a failover and see what happens. So I actually have an app running here. It's very simple. All it's doing is every five seconds, it's connecting to each of the listeners, running the select at at server name SQL statement, and just returning the value of that command. So that will tell us which instance is currently active. It will also give us a count of the errors that are found when attempting the connection. So if we initiate a failover of AG1, all I need to do is step through the wizard, select which instance to fail over to. You can see in this case, there's going to be no data loss because they're using synchronous commit mode. Connect to the instance that I'm going to fail over to. And then wait a few seconds for the failover to complete. And there you go, the failover is complete. You can see the SQL 1 is now secondary for AG1. SQL 2 is primary for AG1. And if I go to failover cluster manager, you can see that the owner no node is now SQL 2, and the IP address that's online is the one in SQL 2 subnet. If I go over to the app, you can see that the active instance is now SQL 2, and there was actually an error during that failover. Let's try the same thing with AG2. So again, we initiate the failover and step through the wizard. Wait a few seconds for the wizard to complete. And there we go, AG2 is failed over. Again, AG2 is now primary on SQL 1. And if we refresh SQL 2, we'll see that AG2 is now secondary on there. Again, we go to failover cluster manager check AG2, the owner node is SQL 1, and the IP address that's online is in SQL 1 subnet. We go back over to the app, you can see that SQL 1 is now the active instance for AG2, and there were no er errors during that failover. Now it's worth pointing out here that actually it's normal to get a connection failure when the failover is completed. And that's usually during the point at which the IP address is moved from one instance to another, or in this case, the IP address changes. What you should do in your app is to have some kind of logic in there to re-attempt the connection. And you'll probably find that on the second attempt, it will probably be successful. So use something like an exponential back off for it. So that's it for the demo. If we go back to the slides. I did have a video here, just in case the demo gods didn't smile on me. But thankfully, that worked, so I can skip over that. If you go to the link on the screen, you will find some step-by-step -step instructions for how to set this up in GCP. There'll be some G Cloud commands, there'll be some PowerShell snippets, and 
it should hopefully give you enough information to get this up and running yourself. I'll let you all take a picture. And all it's left for me to say is thank you for coming along. I hope you found this useful. hope you got some useful information from here.